anything. URL versus IRL. So uh, online, uh, IRL in real life or in the real world. Uh, that is a label we co-opted to talk about uh, what I'd like to talk about today. So I'll start with an apology. Um, no sooner if we co-opted this label, we discovered it had already been co-opted by another group of people to talk about another topic. So if any of you are here today hoping to hear about the angst of teenagers reconciling their social media personas with their actual personalities as they grow up, sorry. <laughs> I've got no interest in that. What I'd like to talk about is the interrelation between online and real-world marketing, which is the space that we play in. I'm Mark Delbert of Captive Media. Um, I've spent 20 years working for media and technology organisations like Vodafone, the BBC, Channel 4, Downing Street Policy Unit for a while. Uh, I'm now the founder of Captive Media, a company I'm not going to talk about today, but which I'll wait till you'll remember, because uh, what we do, among other things, is screw video screens to the walls of loops. Um, why? Well, and not just any screens, these are interactive screens packed with patented technology. Uh, and what we really do actually is help brands engage with young consumers, the very hardest to reach young consumers. Which brings us to the theme, online, offline, URL, IRL. Let's start with where the money is, where people are spending it. An imperfect metric of that is advertising dollars. Where are they spent? 600 billion was spent last year advertising, of which 30% was online. That's 180 billion uh, uh, spent trying to reach people online. So about right? Where are people actually spending their money? Retail spend last year was around 22 trillion, of which less than 6% was actually spent online. So despite all the hue and cry about e-commerce, and it is growing very fast, actually 94% of what we spend is still spent in shops in the traditional way. Are we over enamored of online? Maybe, in fact, that's, a, that's another topic. Uh, one perhaps for a different room than this. Um, but the reason we do it is because, of course, we believe that online influences the path to purchase, so people research products online, buy it offline in the real world. And according to the traditional marketing funnel, you will know from awareness to loyalty. And this is especially true for products more high involvement purchases like cars or holidays, where people research it online. But it cuts both ways. Um, how many of you have seen a dress in a shop and rushed home to see how much it costs and buy it online? I know I have. <laughs> Correctly. Um, uh, so, of course, this purchasing funnel is no longer a funnel, it's a French form, um, metaphorically, with many influences along that path to purchase going backwards and forwards between online and offline. And wouldn't it be nice if we could unpick that a little and understand what? influences, be they online or offline, were more important. Well, there's some great research we think launched a little fanfare at CAMS last year by Ogilvy and Google, which does unpick consumers' top 10 influences. Uh, and here they are. Uh, online and offline. Green is online. Blue is real world. And look at what they are. Number one, this is 2,500 people surveyed over six months, product categories ranging from past to beauty products. Word of mouth, very much real world. Uh, online here, six of the ten are online, and it's things like YouTube, how to videos, there's Twitter. Look, look at search here, it's in the top ten. This isn't even paid search, but it's, it's number ten in the top ten. And as for online display advertising, I mean, it's nowhere. So much for that 180 billion that that's spent, which we had a moment ago. Um, but number one word about number two here, in-store. In-store, consumers change their mind and make the purchase decision in-store. A brilliant example of that last week on a huge scale. This is Peter Cowler and Uga peddling backwards furiously uh, on the election. And as any pollster will tell you, the voter may change their mind in the polling booth. Um, in fact, that is a fact. The percentage of purchase decisions made in store, 40% according to McKinsey, and it varies across product categories, it's actually 70% according to Overly Active. So voters, voters, consumers make up their minds at the very last minute, in many, many cases, no matter what they've been exposed to before. 
So given all that, why would you not focus your marketing and advertising efforts close to the point of purchase as you possibly could? Well, because it's hard. Media gets more and more scarce, and above all, consumers aren't listening. Crucially, they get very hard to reach the closer they get to the shop or the bar. Um, and this brings me to two quick points I want to make that are important to us. Insights on young consumers in particular, new relationship to media. One, continuous partial attention. Here are a bunch of young people on their phones, like half the audience and everyone <laughs> you will ever see on the tube. So it's a fact of life. Young consumers are, in fact, all of us are exposed to over 600 ad messages every day, which we filter out as never before. And that's particularly true of Gen Y consumers. Gen Y watch less TV, certainly linear TV, than they did before. They consume less traditional media. This is particularly true for men, who, basically, young men who stop reading newspapers and magazines almost entirely. It's not true so much for women. But they are out and about 30% more than they were a decade ago. The implication clearly for marketeers is be arrested if you possibly can. Get your message in front of them when they're ready to see it. I suppose to have their nose in their phone. Second point, consumers, young consumers are actively trading their attention now. So you could argue this started with like ITV, but a good early example was Blick. Does anyone remember Blick? A mobile phone network which in 2007 offered free minutes to young consumers in return for receiving ads to their smartphones or to their phones. That's still going today. Fast forward to 2015, and my children, certainly perhaps many of you, see this on their iPods. Would you like to watch an ad in return for 10 coins? Yes, they say. Look away, maybe they watch the ad, but they are paid. And that's it, that in the future we will be paid for our attention. Maybe with coins, maybe with real money, but with something of value. And particularly for Gen Y, novelty is of value. Um, something shareable is of value, something I can tell my friends about. Um, so, how marketed the implication? Be entertaining if you possibly can. How am I doing for time? I've got two quick examples of this uh, to share with you. One is almost, this is what I think a lot of the marketers would like to have. If I can run this. Here is uh, Francesca, this is a company called Literary. There she is shopping, up pops um, a relevant ad to her for a bag, and crucially, at the very same time, there on her phone is a voucher. And it pops up there and there. Oh, she thinks, I've only got 20 minutes to spend it, and then she goes to the shop. Does that ever happen to anybody in this room? If anybody has actually seen this work, Please come and tell me about this, because we'd love to know about it. We, I mean, in our industry, many people are trying this, but the technology isn't quite there. More practically, the other response of marketers is you will see more online media coming into the offline world, the real world. So these digital screens, which I'm sure you've seen, replacing paper ones at the roadside, bus shelters, elevators, um, and this enables some of the benefits of online, measurability, flexibility, to actually reach people, and this is a good example, when they are a captive audience. And I will leave you with uh, one example from captive media, unashamedly, and then back to the general election. This is something we did during the general election. It's a poll of young male consumers to vote for the party leader they liked the least. How? Through the time on the medium, of course, of throwing tomatoes. So a light-hearted thing, but this was, uh, 10,000 games a day in England, Scotland, and Wales. Um, and those results were collated. It was all in, uh, in support of Anthony Nolan and the Cancer Charity. So, with half a million tomatoes thrown, we had a view of the general election result. Did we get it right? I will tell you afterwards. Or, if you would like to come and see this technology yourself, it's installed at Popton 7, where we have an open end next Thursday from 1 till 6. Come and have a drink, talk more about this topic, or even see those remarkable units, or alternatively, the Blueberry Bar. Just so, thanks very much. I didn't get the bell.